welcome everybody to the next meeting of Integrability Journal Club. And today I'm very happy to introduce uh, Jake Stedman from King's College London, uh, who will tell us about gauge sigma models from four dimensional churn assignments. Please, Jake. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Bogdan, uh, Kolya, Evgeny, and Andrea for inviting me today. It's very kind of them. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a paper that I put out um, about a month or so ago that you can find uh, that archive number. Uh, so before I get into the details of what I did, I thought it'd be nice to remind everyone what a SIG model is. So a SIG model is a field theory whose field by, in this case, is a map from some two-dimensional manifold that I've labeled sigma to uh, a target space or a manifold called a target space N. So the manifold for everything I'm going to do today is, is going to be some two-dimensional plane. Uh, and, then the manif and then the target space N could be lots of different things. It could be a group, it could be a sphere, and so on. Um, but I'm going to be interested in the particular case where of gauge sigma models, in which case the target spaces I'm going to find are going to be cosets. Um, so G is some group, uh, some subgroup H, then uh, my, tar my target space is going to be G quotient H. So to ensure kind of everyone knows where I'm heading towards, uh, I thought it'd be nice to tell you about that before I get into the details of it. So, Two years ago now, Costello and Yamazaki used a theory called four-dimensional transcendence theory to generate uh, sigma models by solving the equations of motion. So this action, which is well, this, this theory, which is given by equation two here, uh, is actually about 20 years old. It was first discovered, I think, by Nekrasov in his PhD thesis. But its kind of real power was suggested about eight years ago by Costello in a, a paper where he suggested you could use it to study lattice models. Um, and it's been extended further to field theories. So uh, what I did in my paper was used an extended version of 4D Chan Simons, which I'll show you uh, in a few slides, um, and solved the equations of motion to find some gauged sigma models. And my kind of, well, I haven't proven this bit yet, but the, my hope is that the, the structure of 4D Chan Simons, so it's equations of motion, it's Parson brackets and it's Wilson lines, suggest that these, the models I'm finding should be integrable. So uh, yeah, you will see in later on that I'm finding the gauge was a model and then also I can find the conformal total models as well, but there are more models that one can derive. Before I actually discuss the 4D Chan Simons theory, I thought it'd be nicer to start off with the 3D Chan Simons case because uh, the argument is pretty much the same. So. This was, well, so the, uh, the idea that you could find uh, some conformal field theory on the boundary of, of some chan Simon theory, I think was first suggested by Witten in his Jones polynomial paper, but it was actually confirmed by Moore and Seiberg, Schwimmer and Elitza uh, in the same year, where they solved the equations of motion and found the Wesley and Witten model on the boundary of some cylinder. Uh, the approach that I'm going to show you is one actually developed by uh, Del Duc, Lacroix, Pesedo, and uh, Mc oh, I'm going to screw it up. McGro, sorry, that's the last one. Uh, yeah, McGro, uh, which is the kind of approach that I followed in my paper, and it's more modern and, and to some degree it's nicer to think about. So, yeah, so as everyone will probably know, you uh, you find the, the 3D Chan Simons action by integrating over some manifold, the Chan Simons 3 form, by, uh, by integrating the Chan Simons 3 form over some manifold M that's three dimensional, where we have some gauge field A valued in some, uh, in some the algebra. So to find the sigma models, we're gonna have to solve the equations of motion, which we do by, which we find by varying the action, you find equation four here. So what we find is some bulk term here that tells us that our field A has to be flat, um, and then we find some additional total derivative that when the manifold M has a boundary, gives us some boundary conditions that our field has to satisfy. So this is equation, ends, we end up finding equation five and six here. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. So I, or I kind of dealt with this in my paper and I, I did it for the John Simons theory on, on this manifold. So on the plane crossed with some or on the thick plane, so it has some interval between zero and one. And I'm, I parameterize the plane with x plus and x minus. And then 
uh, parameterize the interval between zero and one with the coordinate z. And so clearly this boundary, or clearly this manifold has a boundary at zero and one that I've colored with magenta and cyan uh, planes here. And so equation uh, six in the previous slide becomes equation seven here. So to solve our equations of motion, we need to solve this equation, which you do using uh, some Carroll and anti Carroll boundary conditions. So these equations at the bottom here. Um, the reason these are called Carroll and anti Carroll boundary conditions is that we actually find the currents on either of these planes. So uh, for the boundary condition at Z1, you find the Carroll current. And for the boundary condition at uh, Z0, you find the anti Carroll current, which is where this nomenclature comes from. So yeah, as I said, this was an approach introduced by these four authors. Um, and as some of you have recognized, you'll think, okay, well, we've got a flat connection. So if we've got a flat connection, then that means we can uh, solve it in terms of some group element or some path ordered exponential given by equation eight here. Uh, Jake, sorry, can I ask uh, a question? Yeah. In, you keep referring to this, this approach of Benoit and friends. Is this different? Are you saying this no, is no, no, yes. what's inside the Masahito and Kevin paper? So it's different in the sense that the boundary, sorry, the gauge they're working in is slightly different. Um, and it makes the construction of the lax connection from the 4D theory much more obvious than in, in the chance. Like, like you just construct the lax connection explicitly, whereas in the Costello Yamazaki paper, you solve the equations of motion and then you do an inverse gauge transformation to find the lattice connection. So with, with oh, the- Okay, so it's just a gauge choice. Yeah, yeah, it's just a gauge choice. So it's, that's the difference between the two. Um, but yeah, I found it easier to think about it this way. And especially once you're introducing the gauged boundary conditions, solving the equations of motion that way just makes life a lot easier. Like, yeah, it, yeah. But yeah, so there are- This, there are this sigma hat is a little different from the sigma hat um, in Yamazaki Costello? I think it ends up being about, I think it ends up being the same, give or take, or pretty much. So the, the constraints or the gauge choice that uh, Benoit and friends um, imposed on their group elements are slightly stronger than the, the approach that Costello and Yamazaki did. So Costello and Yamazaki asked that AZ just was zero at the, at, the, at the poles, right? And they called it a boundary condition. And the reason they want to do that is to, is to ensure the action is finite. Um, Benoit and, and uh, uh, Benoit and his, and his collaborators took a slightly more, well, a slightly stronger constraint where they asked that outside of certain disks, um, the group, um, the, the sigma hat is the identity. And these, these disks are on the fold um, of omega. So yeah, it, but yeah, but it's, yeah, they're the same pretty much. Mm, thanks. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this is the strategy that, I kind of followed in my paper. And so given that we've got a flat connection, you think, okay, well, we can introduce some path ordered exponential. I'm gonna take a slightly different approach and just discuss group elements. And the reason for this is writing down path ordered exponentials in 4D Chen Simons is, it might be possible from some things I've seen in some papers, but it's not easy to think about certainly. So yeah, so using AZ, we introduce a class of group elements that I denoted by G hat here. And the reason we find a class is that uh, we can actually transform g hat by g hat h. And as long as dz of h is zero, then we find the same az. So we've got to pick an element of this class, which I've denoted by sigma hat here. And I'm picking this element such that uh, sigma is the identity at z equals zero. And then I'm going to denote sigma at z equals what sigma hat is at z equals one by sigma. So we can think of this right as just being some path ordered exponential that starts at z equals zero, we get to some point z prime, and then when we get once we get to z equals one, we find sigma. So so that's the same, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is exactly the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, so using this group element sigma, we then define uh, or we then perform a gauge transformation of A to a gauge equivalent field called L, or I denote by L, where L of Z is zero. And in the 4D theory, L will become the last connection of some integral sigma model, but um, in the 3D case, we'll find the last connection of the Weissman model in, in what we follow at the moment. 
So what we do when we've introduced the field L is go, okay, well, since A and L are gauge equivalent to each other, the flatness condition on A must give us a flatness condition on L. So what we're going to do is solve the flatness condition on L and use the boundary conditions on A to find L and then A. Having found A, or the, your field configuration, you substitute it back into the action and you find the Western mean Witten model. So to make this kind of explicit, since uh, L of Z is zero, then the equations of motion that we want to solve are the components that involve Z. And this tells us that the, the L can't be a function of Z, i.e. the L is only a function of X plus and X minus. And so we've got, we're going to then use equation 11 and our boundary conditions. So these two equations here, or well, this equation and this equation. And we're going to note that because of how we've chosen sigma hat, or we've chosen sigma hat to be the identity at z equals zero, it, the equation 11 then from the boundary conditions on A implies that L plus has to be zero, right? Because, the ident because sigma hat's the identity at z equals zero, then clearly L is just equal to A at z equals zero. And because of our boundary condition, L plus must also be zero as well. Similarly, at uh, z equals one, we note that sigma hat, or I just called sigma hat sigma, and then you just find that L is just this equation on the left-hand side of 13. And so this implies that L has to be uh, sigma inverse D minus sigma, right? So this is the last connection of the Western mean Witten model. So yeah, having found this L, it follows our field configuration is this equation at the top of the page, equation 14. And when we substitute this into the action, kind of go through the calculation, it ends up reducing to equation 15, which is the action of the Western mean Witten model, right? So What's nice here is that we started off with some well-known now gauge theory, and we solved the equations of motion. You can find some sigma model on the boundary. Um, and so this is exactly what happens in the 4D case, right? Or well, what we're going to do is we're going to solve the equations of motion in terms of some group elements that we'll introduce in a similar way. And when we do this, we'll find some sigma model on the boundary, on, on some defects in the bulb, right? But the kind of additional caveats from this is that actually the kind of the properties, the easiest way I can kind of say it, the properties of the voice and of the boundary theory do actually follow from the bulk theory, right? So the equations of motion for the Wesley Mino Witten model are just this equation here. But this just is implied straight away from the flatness condition in the plane R squared, right? So our equations of motion for the Wesley Mino Witten model follow from the flatness condition in the bulk John Simons theory. And similarly, if we evaluate our field at our field configuration at either boundary, you find, as I said earlier, the J plus currents and the, the two currents of the Western mean Witten model. So, yeah, before I continue, are there any other questions? Because I'm not going to discuss the 4D case. Um, and it's fairly similar, but there are additional complexities. So now's a nice time to take any questions if there are any. All right, okie So yeah, so as I said earlier, this was, or, or its use in integral, integral models was first proposed by Costello, but was made concrete by a paper with, with Costello, Witten and Yamazaki four years ago now, three years ago. So uh, you construct a 4D theory by taking some four dimensional manifold that is the cross product of some plane sigma that's just gonna be the space of our of our sigma model, and then crossing it with some Riemann sphere, or sorry, with some Riemann surface, uh, that, some two dimensional Riemann surface. But today, I'm just going to take to be the complex projective space. It doesn't have to be; it could be lots of different things. But today, that's what I'm going to fix it to be. So, given this Riemann surface, we can define a meromorphic one form on the Riemann surface. It's just given by this equation here, right? So, it's just a function of z, and it can have zeros and poles. So given this one form and the Chan Simons form, which we construct from some gauge for A that's valued in some complex Lie algebra, we integrate the wedge product of the, of the one form omega with the, with the Chan Simons three form and find the Chan Simons action. So- uh, Sorry, uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Go on. Uh, I mean, for the previous slide. Yeah. Um, so 15, is, uh, is it on equations of motion or, or always? What do you mean? Uh, well, this is a question. 
to derive 15, did you assume equations of motion? Oh, I assume the equations of motion of the John Simon's theory, yeah. Uh, so then the question, um, when I look at 15, uh, what is the surprise? Because if A is flat, it, well, it's a pure gauge. And so, yes, sure, you get uh, a uh, So what exactly is the message I have to learn? So the, so the, the, the message here was just, here's the, the kind of baby version of, of what I'm going to talk about to the 3D theory. Oh, look, you find the, and the word. The, I was just presenting a fairly well-known result, but um, it, it's nice to understand from the four, once you're moving on to the 4D case. I mean, it's not, it's not a unique solution, right? You can choose different boundary conditions and you get different solutions to the equations of motion. It's just for those boundary conditions, you find the Westman model. Um, mm. Well, I'm all right. So when Sigma has different sphere exponent, of course, I get bulk term as you wrote. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's no choice. Uh, do I need to learn something about boundary that I really need to remember for the remainder of the talk? Um, so in the remainder of the talk, you're gonna we're gonna see other. So we saw where is it? So we saw this equation of motion. This this equation seven here that which gives us some boundary conditions that our field has to satisfy. Right, our field has to satisfy on the boundary. Of the manifold that that condition, and we'll see some analogous construction or example of that in the in the chance in the 4D Chen Simon's case. But the solutions aren't like there are many solutions to that equation, right? So you could choose, for example, a and b a to be in some isotropic algebra um, it, it, on the boundary, in which case the trace would vanish, and you then solve equation seven, and you see an analogous boundary condition in the 4D theory. So the the boundary in the 4D theory end, ends up becoming defects at the poles of omega, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, and your boundary conditions on the defects determine the field configuration that you find. Okay, thank you. Uh, where was I? Yeah. So some of you will probably already be aware of this or it'd be obvious to you. So. Because omega is a one form in, in Z and A is a one is a uh, is a one form and contains components in, in DZ components, if we think about if you expand out the components of, of A that contain DZ, you end up finding terms that are like DZ wedge DZ, right? And so these terms vanish, in which case we can actually just set A Z to zero because it's it falls out of the action. It follows the all gauge of fields and all, all gauges. Sorry, it follows the all uh, choices of, of or sorry, it follows that AZ is gauge is you have this gauge symmetry in AZ, right? Plus chi. So all choices of AZ are gauge equivalent to each other because chi can be some arbitrary function. Oh, sorry, yes, yeah, arbitrary algebra value function. And so we can just set AZ to equal to zero and we can stop worrying about it. Right. So the, the, the fields that we're really worried about are the fields on our plane sigma which I've just denoted by i is here, and then z bar, right? So we've actually got three fields that we're worried about as in the three-dimensional case. So again, we vary our action to find the equations of motion because we're gonna be solving, uh, solving our boundary conditions. Well, sorry, solving our equations of motion to find the boundary models. So we find something that's analogous to the slightness condition that we saw in the 3D case. Except now we've got this wedge form with omega, or this wedge with omega at the front of it. And we'll find that because omega can have zeros and poles, we find new uh, solutions to the equations of motion that you don't find in the 3D case. We also find this term uh, out the, on the, on, yeah, we also find the second term. And this plays a similar role to the boundary term that we saw in the, uh, in the 3D case. And the reason that it plays a kind of analogous role is that you have, we think about just the integral of, of d of omega, right? So d of omega. And we take the simplest case where omega is just dz over z minus p, with some, so it has some pole at p. Then clearly, because it's only a function of z, of z, then your derivatives with x plus and x minus are going to vanish. And the term that has a derivative with z will vanish because you've just got dz over z. And so you end up just with this derivative with respect to z bar. We can think of this as actually just, it's a contour around some pole. And so you find uh, 
some non-zero value because of the presence of the pole. So we can treat the poles in omega as being like delta functions in your d omega. And so what we end up finding after we kind of go through this process is equation 21 here. So because we have delta functions at the poles of omega because of this derivative with respect to z bar, we find a sum over the poles of omega. Uh, yeah, we find a sum over the poles of omega. I, we find a sum equation that our field A has to, sat some, has to satisfy. So we have some boundary conditions or we're going to solve it by introducing boundary conditions at the poles of omega. Are there any questions about this? Because it's probably like the main bit of, of the construction. What happens with the second integral over sigma? Uh, what do you mean? Well, it's for dimensional integral. You take poles over CP1. Uh, what happens? Oh, oh, what this? Do you mean this? This? Why? What happened? No, another one. Another one over sigma. Uh, oh yeah, I've just been sloppy and dropped it. This is me just being sloppy. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, this is me being sloppy. It doesn't massively matter. Um, well, I mean, it doesn't. In the ways I'm going to solve it today, it doesn't matter. Um, it probably there are probably solutions to the equation that you could uh, introduce and uh, that are contingent on having that integral, but I haven't thought about them very deeply. So yeah, so if we kind of think about the simplest case again, where we have omega is dz over z. What we find, or it has some poles at zero is infinity. So we pick up some delta functions at zero and infinity. And so we find equation 23, which is just the, the 4D chan Simons analog of the boundary condition equation we saw in the 3D case. I, we've got some defects, we've got some defects at uh, z equals zero and z equals infinity on which our fields have to satisfy some boundary conditions, which I color, um, colored these cyan, with, with, yeah, on these planes, and I've, I've covered colored them with cyan and magenta here. So the kind of simplest examples that are often discussed in the literature, which were first introduced by uh, more, si well, sorry, by uh, Wood and Costello and Yamazaki, are these kind of three equations here. So these first two are just the kind of, just the Carroll and anti carroll boundary conditions that we saw in the previous, uh, Example, but you can also have say you can also ask that it's isotropic, right? We can ask that it's in some Lie algebra such as the product of any two elements of the Lie algebra, and you take the trace of it vanishes. But because the boundary conditions uh, are determined by the poles of omega, we can have higher order poles. We don't just have to have first order poles, isn't that a fairly trivial example? We could have second or third order poles and so on. So if we have a second order pole, then you're asked to actually solve at at a pole, we're solving this equation. And the simplest, uh, the simplest solution to this is just asking that a is zero on the defect at the pole, which is the simplest version I'm going to deal with today. Um, yeah. So as in the 3D case, we follow a similar strategy. Can where omega have cuts? Sorry, go on. Can Omega have cuts? Um, what do you mean? No, so here it is a pulse, yes, but yeah. In principle, oh, do you mean like so if someone chooses omega with cuts, is there something interesting uh, models uh, which will come from omega with cuts? I don't know what you mean by cuts. Sorry, I'm confused. O omega is a function of z, right? Uh, yeah, and z is just. Uh, complex variable yeah so in principle there could be oh many... cusps yeah sorry i haven't i don't know <clears throat> sorry yeah i genuinely don't know i can't say no not like, cusps not... he's asking yeah. about cuts yeah cuts branch cuts yeah no yeah i don't know i don't know sorry i thought but it's a good question no, i actually hadn't thought about it um hey, I sorry i might i might uh, be getting this wrong, but I thought the idea was that on when you have these symmetric space models or semi-symmetric space models, that you introduce a kind of cut um, oh. that's consistent with the Z2 or Z4 symmetry. I don't remotely understand the, the symmetric space model construction that they did in that paper. They, they introduced these three D these three dimensional defects in somewhere or another, don't they? Well, yeah, I don't know about three-dimensional, but I think 
you can yeah. understand that uh, if you started, well, maybe maybe I save this for coffee. Yeah, no, it's a good discussion because I don't, if, if anyone has anything to say about that or can explain it to me because I don't really understand it at the moment. I kind of read it in one. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, if, if Omega had branch cuts, wouldn't that just mean that the, the sphere is replaced by a Riemann surface? Because it's living on some... Oh, it depends surface. whether you integrate over the next sheet in this uh, way or not. Uh, right? if, if you don't, then probably uh -huh. don't. Yeah. There's something ugly. If you, if you integrate over all the sheets, I think it's a bit like going to high genus. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so we follow a similar strategy again, except this time, instead of using AZ, uh, we use AZ bar to introduce our group elements. So we say, okay, defining some group elements, uh, it's G hat using AZ bar. Again, we would find some class for the same reason that we did in the, in the previous case where we can take g hat to g hat h, and as long as the z bar of h is zero, we find the same field. So again, I'm going to pick some element of this class. In this case, I'm going to denote it by sigma hat, and I'm going to choose it such that it's the identity at the pole of the mega, right? So this is the analog of choosing sigma hat to be one at the boundary of some manifold in the 3D case. Using this sigma hat, we can perform a gauge transformation as we did in the previous case, and find a field L from A, and again, because of how we've defined uh, AZ bar, it follows the a, um, LZ bar is zero. And, and we'll see in a moment that actually it satisfies the conditions that we require of, of a lax connection and, and gives us the lax connections of, of some integral signal model. So again, because A and L uh, are gauge equivalent to each other, it follows that our equation of motion for A gives us some equation for L. And then using the boundary conditions on A, we can solve to find L. Finally, once we found L, we can then find A, substitute it into the action, and we'll find some integral signal model in this way. So yeah. So to remind everyone what a lax connection is, uh, connection is a lax connection if it has satisfies three properties. So the first is uh, if it has some meromorphic dependence on some complex parameter Z. So in this case, it's going to we're going to find that it's going to be this. Uh, this complex parameter that's on our on the complex projective space, or more generally the uh, the Riemann surface, uh, it has to be flat in the kind of physical space of our theory, right? So in the in the plane sigma, and the flatness condition tells us the equations of motion for our sigma model. And finally, we can construct some path ordered exponential of the field L. Uh, called the modular matrix, and if we tailor expand this in powers of z, we find as coefficients some charges, and, and you can show that uh, you can show using some, or at least in the simplest case where you have a, a cylinder, you can show that uh, the time derivative of, of the uh, Taylor expansion is zero, and gives us uh, yeah, gives us some conserved charges, and these charges we also want these charges to pass and commute with each other. So the kind of interesting thing about 4D Chan Simons is that all of these properties actually follow from the gauge theory. So the simplest case is the flatness condition, which just follows from our equations of motion. Similarly, as I'll, I'll explain in the next slide, the monomorphic dependence also follows from the equations of motion. The charges follow from Wilson lines, right? So we can construct some Wilson lines, which, ref, which in the, so let's take si sigma to just be the cylinder. We can think of some Wilson lines wrapping around our plane in this kind of way. And if you, uh, and yeah, and you can, because of the gauge equivalence of A and NL, and the fact you're taking the trace of some path ordered exponential, you find that the two are gauge equivalent to, to each other um, and find your charges from, ta from Taylor expansion, from Taylor expanding your Wilson lines in Z. And then uh, Benoit actually proved that the, or, or proved that the, proved the Poisson commutation in another paper of his. Um, that's quite nice and also shows, discusses a connection to fine Gaudin models as well. So yeah, so to give the meromorphic dependence, we have from uh, our equations of motion, if we consider just the z-bar components, we have this equation that's got to be equal to zero. And so we ask, so we find that five z dz bar of L has to be equal to zero since L z bar is zero. 
So as I kind of said earlier, well, because omega can have zeros, well, it follows that obviously phi has zeros. And since phi has zeros, the equality here can be satisfied without dz bar of L being zero, right? So at the zeros of, of phi, dz bar of L can be non-zero. Away from these zeros, however, this isn't the case. So away from these zeros, dz bar of L has to be zero. And so we're left asking, okay, well, what are the functions that satisfy this condition? And it's just, the answer is, is meromorphic functions, right? Meromorphic functions uh, satisfy this condition. And so it follows that L must be meromorphic in, in the, the parameter Z, right? So you're starting to see the connection with, with uh, the spectral parameter here. So everything I did in my paper, I, I truncated it to just consider, oh, sorry, I simplified, the, I simplified it so that phi only contained second order poles. And when you do this, you can show a truncation of the Velax connection once you solve uh, this equation. So yeah, so equation 26 here is just the solution to this equation. So this is some function of x plus and x minus. And then the second term here just comes from some uh, partial fraction expansion. Um, and there's no kind of linear terms here because of, 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 because of the restriction of, of phi to be second order in poles at most. So the way that uh, you actually insert these poles from the point of view of the gauge theory is by imposing some boundary conditions on the field. So since we want some poles in our, or, or the poles in L are clearly just also poles in the field A, you can insert these poles by asking, okay, at some zero, that's of order n, of order n i. If we ask that the product of, of, of z minus is zero to the power of n i with the field A is regular, then clearly A can have poles that are at most of order n i. So this is how we kind of do it. So I'm gonna brush over the details of, of this, although I can talk about it a bit later if people want me to, but it turns out that you can make a gauge choice on your, uh, on your field and reduce the 4D theory to a three-dimensional action. So as kind of Bogdan hinted at earlier, the way that uh, Costello and Yamazaki did this was by asking that uh, AZ bar was zero at the poles of omega. Um, and then they constructed solutions to the equations of motion that satisfied that condition. And then you, so they substituted into the action and found some sigma models. Um, uh, and, yeah, but it, yeah, I, there's a, a discussion in my paper of, of mentioning this is actually a gauge choice and because the action can be shown to be gauge invariant, it follows that actually, if you're working, yeah, it follows that it, this is actually just a gauge choice that proves the action is manifestly finite. And from that, uh, it follows. Benoit and his collaborators did this in a slightly different way. So they took the group elements and imposed some some conditions on these fields. So they asked that they were rotationally invariant uh, and, uh, a and a couple of other conditions. And when you do this, you can and substitute, uh, I should have written it on this page and substitute that A is equal to sigma hat D sigma hat inverse plus sigma hat L sigma hat inverse. When you substitute that equation into the 4D chan Simons action and impose these conditions, you reduce it to equation 27 here. Right, which they called the unified sigma model action. And we'll find, or in, in a moment, we'll find an analog with this in, in, uh, for gauged sigma models. All right, so what we have when you reduce from the 4D action to the 2D action, right, is a bunch of kinetic terms that couple your, your lax connection with some sigma model, with some group element sigma that appear at the poles of omega, and then a bunch of, of Wesmino terms, right? And so I should probably add that L is actually just a function of sigma as well. Um, so yeah, so this is the kind of nice thing about 4D chance assignments, right? Is we can use a bunch of geometric arguments. We can impose some boundary conditions on our field and solve some equations of motion. Um, and you find some lax connection by doing this, right? Where, where our boundary conditions are imposed at the zeros and poles of omega. And once we found this lax connection, you substitute it into the action, you find the action of some sigma model in this way. And this is exactly well, this is the approach I, I, made, I took advantage of in the, in the paper. Um, so I'm about to discuss this and we are about, no, no, I've got some examples and then, then it's, put, yeah. All right, so the simplest examples are when omega is dz over z, which I mentioned earlier. 
And we so we just have some uh, poles at zero and infinity. There aren't any zeros in this case. And I'm going to take the kind of 4D Chan Simons analog uh, analogous boundary conditions that I took in the 3D case. So I'm going to ask that A plus is zero infinity and A minus is zero at zero. And then I'm going to pick the group element sigma hat such that it's the identity at infinity. And I'm going to denote it by sigma at zero. And so our boundary conditions and the conditions on uh, and the this choice of sigma imply that L is equal to A at, at infinity. And the boundary condition therefore gives that A plus is zero. And similarly, uh, the and similarly at z equals zero, we find this equation. And so that uh, L is uh, sigma inverse d minus sigma, right? which is the last connection of the Wesson Minowitz model that I mentioned earlier. And when you substitute into that unified action I just showed you, you find equation 31 here. But what's nice about 4D Sean Simons is that omega isn't unique, right? There are many choices of omega we can make. And so if we consider the simplest case where we have some zero on pole, and this was done first by Costello and Yamazaki in their paper, and, and then reviewed in this way by in the, I'm presenting here by Benoit and his collaborators. So if we choose an omega such that there's a zero uh, uh, that equals uh, plus or minus one, and then some poles at uh, P and infinity. And then we're gonna ask that uh, A plus has a, uh, has a pole at uh, z equals one and a minus has a pole at z equals zero. And I'm, because we've got second order, uh, sorry, because we've got poles that go z squared in our, uh, in, our in, in omega, we're gonna impose these Dirichlet boundary conditions that I, imposed, that I mentioned earlier at z equals infinity and z equals zero. Right? So we're gonna ask a plus and a minus vanish at either pole. And I'm gonna pick group the group element so that it's the identity at infinity. And when we do this, you actually find that all of these Y terms vanish, right? Because this just goes to zero at infinity. And so the boundary condition uh, implies that, that these Ys have to vanish. While at uh, 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 P, at the pole at P, we end up finding these Vs are given by this equation. And so we find this equation here, which is the last connection of your principal car model, as many of you will recognize. And when substituted into the action, we find exactly that. So this is a natural time to probably pause and I guess go on the break because I'm about to introduce the, the, my own work and not the review that I've just been doing. Um, and yeah, and take some questions and have a discussion because I think we've been going for 14 minutes now, haven't we, give or take? Yeah, okay, yeah. good. So maybe one short question before we pause about this part. Otherwise, we will press it uh, during the coffee break. Okay, so I pause. Um... So, yeah, so we've now reached the point where I can discuss what I did. So this was inspired by a paper from Moore and Cyberg 30 years ago, where they constructed an analogous version of what I did for uh, just three-dimensional transcendence theory. So if we kind of ignore this boundary term that I've got here at the moment and just think of some so if, if we think of these things as just being transcendence, uh, three-dimensional transcendence actions, where we have some field A and a field B, A is valued in some Lie algebra G and B is in some Lie algebra H, that's a subalgebra of G. And we ignore this boundary term for a moment. What they did is say, okay, well, I'm going to add in some Lagrange multiplier that imposes that uh, A has to be equal to the B on the boundary. Uh, and when they kind of impose this, this Lagrange multiplier and solve the equations of motion in the analogous way that I kind of discussed above, you end up finding the gauge for the amino model. And you can do that for the 4D case, um, and it does work, and you do find the gauge for the amino model. I wasn't a massive fan of this because you lose the kind of obvious integrable structure. You, you, your equations of motion become modified and, and things become less clean and it becomes less obvious that things might be integrable. So I kind of, after a little playing around, I realized, okay, well, that adding in that boundary term is just a modification to the boundary equations of motion, right? 
So I can just add in an analogous boundary term to the action and we can get the same result. So we can preserve the bulk equations of motion, which give us the relation to lax connections of some integral signal model, but we can modify the boundary equations of motion so that we end up for some potential coupling between A and B if we impose some of the right boundary conditions on, on the poles. So yeah, so now in the 40 case, we have two four-dimensional trans Simons actions with a field A and B, uh, where A is in G and B is in subalgebra H. Um, and again, I, I'm fixing C to just be CP1. So when we, yeah, as we vary the action, we find these equations of motion that I just mentioned. So the thing that was kind of new in my paper was this boundary equation of motion that modifies the equations on the defects or the conditions on the defects. And because B is in a subalgebra of G, we're going to see life becomes easier just by decomposing in decomposing the Lie algebra into a some orthogonal complement like denoted by F and then H. And so if we do this, equation 39 becomes uh, equation 40 in the orthogonal complement. So we just have some condition on our fields A in the orthogonal complement. Uh, yeah, so the reason that there are no Bs here is because B clearly vanishes in the orthogonal complement if it's a if it's a field in H. And then we end up with this additional equation of motion in H. So we allow for some potential coupling uh, between A and B. So what I did was say, okay, well, we've got this second equation. It becomes possible to um, ask that because of the zero in this equation, or because of the difference in this equation, I can ask that A and B are equal to each other on, a, on some defect. So I can introduce gauged versions of the boundary conditions that you see in the 4D theory, where you impose the same boundary condition that you'd see in the, th in the original case, but you still preserve, and I'll explain why in a second, you still preserve some gauge symmetry in H on the defect. So clearly, this constraint uh, constrains your gauge transformations on the defects, such as they've got to preserve the constraint. The constraint in the A in the subalgebra H is equal to B constrains your, your gauge transformations in A such that they're equal to the ones in B. But you still end up with some leftover gauge symmetry in B, right? So on each defect, you still have a gauge symmetry in H. And the result of the gauge symmetry in H from the point of view of the sigma model is that your orbits of G end up becoming, the orbits of G generated by your, the action of the gauge symmetry become identified. And so what we find is some gauge sigma models where, whose target space is just G quotient H and it's because of the, the preservation of this, uh, of this, of this uh, of subgroup of gauge transformations. So yeah, so in the simplest case where you just have first order poles, these are the, the boundary conditions that I discussed in my paper. But you can also have second order poles and you get what's called a gauge Dirichlet boundary condition. So we end up with some preserved subgroup on the, uh, on the defect. And in fact, if you impose, so if you take omega to be the same form that we saw earlier, squared minus one over minus P, Z. So the one form that we see for the principal Carroll model and then you impose the gauge Dirichlet boundary condition at the poles and work your way through it, you end up finding something that I guess would be called the gauged principal chiral model. Um, so to go into more detail, or well, more generally is as we did in the 4D case, we introduce two, well, this time two classes of group elements, G hat and H hat, and we do it in exactly the same way. So we use it using, we do it using uh, AZ bar and BZ bar. And again, for the same reason that these two equations have some symmetry, we pick two group elements from these classes. So I'm um, them sigma hat and um, psi hat. And we pick these group elements such that they're the identity at some pole of omega. It doesn't have to be the same pole. In everything I discussed, I did choose the same pole just because it makes life a bit easier. Given these group elements, we do the same thing we did in the 4D case. So we perform a gauge transformation on A by and B by these two group elements and find two fields, gauge equivalent fields, LA and LB. So it's important to note, and I, I hinted to this in the, in the discussion, 
these two lattice connections aren't independent from each other because of our boundary condition at the poles of omega, i.e. that that a and b have to be equal in in h. We find this equation here, right? So this line sub h here is is to indic indicates the projection into h. So we find that, that the projection of this left hand side has got to be equal to the to the right hand side. So we end up with some relation between the two lattice connections of our uh, these two potential lattice connections, I should say, really, um, on at the plaza of omega, and in, we'll see in a moment these are actually actually becomes an equation in motion for some sigma model. So, as Benoit and his collaborators did in in their paper, you can choose some gauge in which which the action is is finite and reduce it from the four D action to some two dimensional action which I decided to call the unified gauged action. And for the cases where the subgroup H is, you still have some gauge symmetry in the subgroup H, it turns out that you can set psi hat to be one everywhere in the bulk. Um, there are boundary conditions where this isn't necessarily the case, but I'm not gonna talk about them today. And they add in complexities that I don't think are worth discussing. So when you, when you do this, when you set psi hat to be one everywhere, it turns out that the, the bulk term associated to B vanishes. And so what we end up with is this unified action that Benoit and, and Del Duke and, and Lacroix and uh, Margot introduced, plus some new terms that arise because of the boundary term that I added in. Right? So we end up with some at each pole, we end up with some coupling between sigma hat and the lattice connection of B, and then some coupling between the two lattice connections. And so this equation, equation 45 here, reduces to equation 47 and it turns out that actually you can vary the fields in, in equation 46 here and you find equation 47 by doing this um so the simplest example of this is the gauge to amino witten model so as we did in the uh in the previous uh few slides. We use the equivalence between L and A and, and L and uh, uh, LB and B. And the reason there are no psi's here is because I set it to one, remember. Um, and then similarly, this is only a function of X plus and X minus because uh, BZ bar is zero. And so our equations of motion tell us that DZ bar of B has to be zero. And so we fix Omega to be dz over z. Uh, sorry, uh, can uh, can you remind a little bit of notations? Uh, mm, uh, so uh, there is there was sigma hat, right? Yeah. Oh, there should be um, hats on. Ah, yeah. Sorry. So, oh, sorry. Continue, and then, and then I can. Yeah. So sigma hat is p exponent of a, right or yeah. not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so why is sigma g sigma plus sigma a sigma is non zero? I mean, it's uh, like. Oh, because you don't have a gauge symmetry, a preserved gauge symmetry on the defects um, at the poles of omega for a. You, your group is, the group g is, has to preserve. Okay, so, yeah. So if you're, so if you're preserving, say, this in, in the orthogonal complement, you, rest, you restrict your gauge transformations. To preserve that, and so you don't end up with the total gauge symmetry in G, which is why sigma hat can't be the identity generally. Okay, and then um, so there was a sigma hat which called psi for B, right? Yeah, and you say it's equal to what basically, right? Yeah, why B is not non zero because it's P exponent of zero is one. I'm not sure I can do something. No, because. so. Oh, as, as being so we've just if, if you set psi had to be one everywhere then clearly this just vanishes but this is yeah, only this is, yeah. bz bar this is not this doesn't tell us anything about b plus and b minus right the other fields in the plane right? in the in the plane so if, if we take it to be r squared cross our manifold to be r squared cross cp1 this condition doesn't tell us about B plus and B minus on uh, R squared. Uh, 
Uh -huh. So we still have two functions. Well, the flatness condition ends up telling us that actually these things can only be functions of x plus and x minus. But, mm. um, um, okay, I think you'll get it. Yes, thank you. No problem. Mm. Are there any other questions? All right, thank you. So yeah, so I should note that this sigma p here is is uh, me using some notation to indicate that sigma hat is evaluated at the pole p. Um, so yeah, so we we choose omega to be dz over z with poles of zero and infinity, and we introduce two uh, two lax connections. So we solve uh, f of z bar i of l equals zero. And because there are no zeros in, in omega, we just find the uh, right-hand side here. So I'm going to impose the chiral and anti-chiral boundary conditions at zero and infinity. So this is the chiral one. And this is the anti-chiral one. And we choose sigma hat to be the identity at infinity and then call it sigma at, at zero, as we did in the previous few slides. When we use our boundary conditions to fix the form of, uh, the form of our lax connection, you end up finding these two equations here. So this is the lax connection of the western mean western model, or what you find when you vary the equations of motion, sorry, the action, you find that the equation of motion is a flatness condition of, of this term. And then similarly, you also find some flatness condition on the, on the field in the, in, the, in the action as well. Um, so uh, since Bogdan mentioned it a few slides or, or uh, a little while ago, the, this is because I wanted to include these B fields in, in the lattice connections, or more generally some gauge fields in lattice connections. This is the reason I went with the Benoit Vesedo, um kind of way of constructing these models rather than the original Costello Yamazaki ways, because it becomes easier to introduce these fields. Um, when we substitute this solution into the unified action, what we find is uh, the gauge versus mean width model, where this, sigma, where this S of sigma is the versus mean width model. And I should have included this, but we also find, if you vary this action, you find that, uh, or you find two equations of motion, I'll just show you one of them for the moment. You find this projected into H has to be equal to B minus, but this is exactly this equation here for the gauge versus mean width model. All right, so what's nice about the 4D theory and the way that I modified it is that our boundary equations of motion as well as the flatness conditions on, on the fields give us the equations of motion for some sigma model, right? The boundary equation motion gives us this, this gauging condition. And then the flatness conditions give us the actual the, two other equations of motion. Um, but we don't just have to discuss that case where we have two subgroups. We could think about more general cases with more subgroups. So. Uh, this is a way of finding what I decided. I forgot to modify this slide. There should be a gauge here. This is a, a way of- uh, Sorry, can I interrupt? Sorry, uh, yeah. I have another question. Uh, so I belong to people who learned about, uh, it's Bogdan was like asking already about symmetric spaces and uh, just uh, not gauge sigma models, but normal sigma models on corset. Uh, but I know a little bit less about gauged. Uh, okay. Oh, cases. yeah. Okay. Can you make a comparison? Uh, like between yeah, so two I, cases? Can, I can tell you. So, are you familiar with COSET models in like COSET Western Mean Western models or GKO constructions? Well, I mean, symmetric space sigma models just. No, uh, is, so, okay. uh, is it too far away? But I mean, I just want integrability. So, so I have a suspicion although I've not yet done this calculation, the, the, so the symmetric space sigma models can be found as some, the T, uh, Benoit will have to correct me because I'm gonna get this wrong. They're, they're Poisson dual to some lambda deformation of the gauge versus amino with model, aren't they? Or something like that. Um, which models? The yeah. symmetric space sigma models. There's the some relation to it. Deformations, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm reasonably certain with the appropriate choice of boundary conditions that you can find a lambda deformation of the gauge versus mean model from my theory. So 
you can find a lambda def yeah so a lambda deformation of equation 51 in which case i think you re recover the symmetric space signal models um or you recover something that's dual to the symmetric space signal models if that's what you're asking well i mean kind of in this setup we learned that being symmetric space is important for you it's not important no yeah uh, it could be any uh, and okay, but when you say the word lux connection, does it actually mean that uh, this model is integrable, right? Uh, so is this is not some other lux connection for something else. It's really lux connection saying that it's an integrable model. Yeah, so the, so yeah. the gauge was, I mean, a Witten model is integrable and it has a lux connection. Um, and it it is doesn't this... need to be symmetric, right? So... No, it doesn't need to be symmetric, no. So the... If you think about the hey, Drake, uh, non symmetric in the sense that you have this defect insertion, maybe I can precise my, my point. So you, you have uh, in, in your initial construction, you have uh, in this uh, two, 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 two independent uh, subgroup construction, you have two uh, fl fl flat conditions, uh, flatness conditions for each A and B. And this, uh, and uh, they are intertwined in this, uh, what is this equation 45, right? Yeah. And then uh, once uh, the, the only point, can you clarify, once you do the gauge fixing, in your case, okay, uh, I choose this, in either of these two groups elements, uh, I choose it to be one of, of these hats, and then uh, you say that there is no gauge freedom which is left, which is on the defect, or not? Because you say, essentially, you still have a gauge freedom on the localized on the defect, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But once you, once you are gauging, how, how much freedoms are left or what is left? So to reduce to the two-dimensional action, there's still, you still have the gauge symmetry on the defect. You don't need to fix that symmetry to do that. If you're solving yeah. the equations of motion of the sigma model, then clearly you do need to fix that symmetry. So essentially this fixing results in this boundary equation that you write for the B, B minus, I mean, for the gauge with the WZW. Uh, no, so no, no, the, this additional equation doesn't follow from the fixing, it just follows from varying the action. If you vary the action, you find this additional equation. No, no, I mean, above you have uh, LA and LB, right? Yeah. This is equation from, from exactly for, for your sigma hat restriction to the uh, particular yeah. pole. Okay, but then this uh, extra condition is following from your intertwining condition or not? I mean, this boundary. boundary oh, yeah, it, it follows from the boundary condition, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, all right. Any other questions or? Okay. But, but does this, it has, this extra condition should just come from integrating out B, no? In the action. Uh, what, in equation 51? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. So yeah, so it's not just, that kind of that case, or the gauge versus immunity model case, but you can also consider uh, something called the nil potent gauge versus immunity model, which was introduced by Bale, Gorefti, Whip, Forgatch, and Verheer to uh, recover the, or classically recover the conformal total models. So you can find this from the 4D Chan Simons action. So to do this, we do something a bit odd. We introduce again the field A valued in some the algebra H, G, sorry. And then we take the null potent subalgebra associated to uh, lowering operators and null potent subalgebra associated to raising operators and uh, choose two fields B and C to be valued in each one of them, as well as two Lagrange multipliers mu and nu. And so what we do is we introduce two uh, Chan Simons fields associated to B in uh, 4 D Chan Simons fields associated to B and C, and then couple them together with uh, like analogous versions of the um, the the boundary term that we saw in the previous few examples. So this is what this B and, and C are. So this is this subscript means it's at zero, and this one means it's at infinity. And then we also ask that there's a product of A minus with mu, um, and this is here because it it gives us the right equations for motion for the model that we're trying to find, or it gives us the right action for the model we're trying to find as well. But the two subalgebras, uh, N plus and N minus are isotropic, and because they're isotropic, it means that B, S of B and S of C vanish, 
this doesn't happen for these two boundary terms because the trace of, so if we take uh, an element of, uh, which is in, I call it, I'll put a superscript, which is in N minus, the trace of, of some element with, in the positive subalgebra, uh, and the negative one is, is not zero. I forget the, what it is. It's, uh, alpha and beta are two simple roots. It's, uh, yeah, I think it's that. All right, so we still end up with, the reason these boundary terms don't vanish is because of this trace. And so we still pick up the, uh, yeah, so we still pick up the negative parts of the subalgebra of, of uh, A and the positive parts of the subalgebra of B here. So if we, we can kind of forget about these two bulk terms because they vanish and vary our action. And what we find is equation 53. So again, this flatness condition or, or almost flatness condition on our uh, on our field, which give us gives us the this meromorphic dependence and so on, all the different things that we want. And then we also find these two equations of motion on our field, which are pretty ugly to be honest. Um, when we solve them, what we do is we ask that a is equal to c, right? So all of the, since a, since c is in, is in the positive subalgebra, we ask that all the components of a in the Cartan subalgebra and the negative subalgebra vanish. And then we ask that the projection of a plus into the negative subalgebra is equal to mu. And then we, the analogous boundary conditions for uh, at infinity for a and b. We, as we did in the previous case, pick our, our group element to be uh, the identity at infinity. Oh, I should have, oh, I forgot to add this. I should have added that we're choosing omega to be dz over z, which is why we have poles at zero is infinity, which is why we've got these boundary terms. Sorry, I forgot to add that back in, I should have. Um, so yeah, so we pick our group elements such, such that it's the identity at zero and infinity, uh, uh, sorry, it's the identity at infinity and sigma at zero. And then when we solve the equations of motion using our boundary conditions in the same way that we did in the previous examples, what we find are these three equations, right? So this is the, the last connection of the of this nilpotent gauge resonator, uh, nilpotent gauge resonator with the model. And then we find these two additional boundary conditions um, on, our, on our action. We substitute this into the action. Uh, then what we find is equation uh, 61 here. And this is the action that uh, those authors I mentioned use to recover the total model. So, mm, sorry, I have a very simple question. Go on. BNC, BNC independent hills, right? Yeah, yeah, they're independent. Uh, in the they just... yeah. No, but if you look 55, like previous formula. Uh, oh, no, no. So, okay. So then, naively, they're, they're, they're independent. They're not, okay. They're, no, they are, they're just completely independent from each other because the flatness condition on the first equation, if you substitute the second equation into the flatness condition on the first equation, you just find some... Uh, no, but can, can, I just, can, can you show 55? Uh, just previous slide, can you Yeah, yeah, sorry. Please? A little bit more, even with, so right, so like, like, like slide side, like, okay, so in 52, B appears as Lagrange multiplier, Gilpotent Lagrange multiplier. Yeah. Why don't you say that uh, trace of A is zero? I mean, trace of A of H delta B zero. Well, I mean, why do you solve non-trivially 55? I mean, you have to keep delta A separately, delta B separately. So, uh, okay. So if this is in the positive uh -huh. subalgebra, then this is in the, then you only pick up the terms from the negative one and then the, analogously for this as well, which is why you end up with, I didn't um, want to, because it's an ugly equation but you still end up with... So uh, C minus and B plus do not mean original. I oh, know they, they do mean that. Uh, right, okay. So you actually... Uh, they're, they are completely yeah, independent yeah. from each other, yeah. Yeah, so 54 is, for instance, 54, for instance, two equations, right? Uh, delta, with delta A and delta C separately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you expand it out into, out, expand out the word, no, it's a single equation. No, but variation of A and C should be independent. You say it's independent fields. No, right? because the, 
because of this equation, your variations end up becoming, you can, imp you can impose boundary conditions such that the variation of A is equal to the variation of C. Okay. So yeah, so the simplest case uh, that they discussed in this paper is, or, or the process of finding these total models from, from this action is you set, you choose a gauge or partial gauge technically, you, you set that C minus and B plus are equal to zero and then you perform a Gauss decomposition. And when you do this, you find a total model. So for the, the case where you, you've just got SL2, you find the Abel theory. Um, yeah, so are there any questions? Because I think we're near the, yeah, we're near the end. Um, so, yeah, so these are the things I still need to kind of confirm or want to look at next. So the first is, as I mentioned earlier, I still need to check what the Poisson brackets are. Um, I'm hoping that I'll find the Poisson brackets imply the charges of the of the last of the, the charges for, for associated to uh, LA and LB or some subset of those char of those charges will pass on commute with each other and that all um that will show integrability or should hopefully show integrability. Um all the other conditions so the meromorphic dependence, the the equations of motion, the fact that the charges even exist just follows in the same way from in the doubled theory as it does from the, the 4D theory where it just follows from the equations of motion in the Wilson lines of the 4D chan Simons theory. Um, but there has been other work on, on uh, integral models using uh, an extension or, or a kind of generalization of 4D chan Simons to 60 chan Simons. So instead of having uh, omega to be a one form, you make it to be a, you, you construct it to be a three form. So you take this capital omega times the trace of, of your chan Simons form. And uh, you can, in a fairly analogous way of solving some equations of motion, uh, you can find higher dimensional integral models. So you can find higher dimension, or a higher dimensional version of the Wells Mina Witter model that's integrable, uh, and then various other things as well. Um, or, or so from the 60 theory, you find a 4D Wells Mina Witter model that's integrable, and then you can reduce it back to the 2D case as well. Um, so right. I'd like to. So you mean integrable in, in, in the sense, of course, uh, of the existence of the lux, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, so I'm, it'd be nice to replace this, this D omega with a, a D of capital omega and look at the same thing and see what kinds of models you find. Um, yeah, I haven't yet done this yet. Um, the final thing is I'm hoping that, or I have some reason to expect to find some lattice models from the doubled Jan Simons action. So it turns out that this boundary term, if you look at it uh, in, the, uh, in the quantum case, this boundary term gives you some correlators between A and B. And the correlators between A and B are interesting for the following reasons. So uh, yeah, if I add in another page. <coughs> so standard 4D Jan Simons, way that one requires or recovers lattice models and in doing so like the Yangian structure and so on is by looking at uh, Wilson lines, which are the path ordered exponential of some line integral uh, over some curve in Sigma. And the reason that these things are observable is you, you choose some appropriate boundary conditions on your field and these things extend from infinity from infinity and sigma to another point, another point at infinity and sigma, which is why these things are observable. That's the gauge invariant. And what Costello, Witten, and Yamazaki looked at were the tense of the expectation value of the tensor product of, of these lines, uh, like so that they were crossing like this. And if you calculate it to first order and do and perform a Taylor expansion, what you find is, is the identity in the tensor product of the two representations were on row prime plus h bar c row, row prime over minus z1 minus z2. So this is in z1, this is at the position in z2 in, in this complex projective space, or in the, in, sorry, it's not a complex projective space in this case, in this complex plane, 
where and and this C rho rho prime is this split Casimir. Um, so in the doubled 4D case, you find a propagator between A and B. And because you find a propagator between A and B, you um, it follows that there's some correlator between uh, the tensor product of two Wilson lines associated to rho, associated to A and B. And then from this, you then in the same way, find some R matrix. And uh, I'm hoping that when you calculate, I haven't yet done this, but I'm working on it. When you calculate the fusion algebra of the Wilson lines, you should recover some kind of nice quantum group structure associated to cosets. Um, but I haven't got a clue what that would be at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that, that that's what I'll find. And then that should hopefully link back into the, the integrability of these sigma models um, as well. Um, but yeah, so that is the end of my talk. Thank you for coming. It was very kind of you all to invite me. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so let's unmute ourselves and thanks, Jake. Uh, and now we have um, time for a few questions. These extra terms you added, um, uh, sort of on the boundary. Um, no, it's okay. Um, do they no, change it's the it's propagator? Right. Do they what? Sorry. Change the propagator? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you integrate this by parts, you end up with, and then you do the, you calculate the propagator in the fairly standard way. You end up finding some, some. They change the propagators. Uh, they only change the propagators for A and B, like between the fields, like A to A and B to B. They, I think they only change it by like a factor of half or something like that. They don't no, change They also it. give you some A. Yeah, they also give you some A, a to B propagator, yeah. Sorry, Jake, uh, if you can elaborate more on this uh, lattice limit or lattice construction, I'm just wondering, do you think for, from your prescri uh, prescription or even this forgage uh, example, when you mean this other lattice coming from three fields, uh, do you think through this fusion uh, representation construction, you can get something related to the quantum group structure of the total lattice models or not? So this is what I've been, so given I can find the conformal total models, like field theories, it seems reasonable to think that you might be able to find the lattice models from this, this, this. And this criticization procedure would be exactly through these fusions. Hello? Uh, Jenny, can you hear me or it's just me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Ah, I cannot hear Jake, okay. Yeah, me too, Jake. Jake, you are muted, I think, no? I don't know. So that he's unmuted. Was I muted for that, what I just said? Okay, now we hear you. Oh, what is going on? Oh, oh. Maybe we can stop recording while uh, continue after the issues. Okay. Okay. Um,